why, why didn't the Europeans get their way? The Europeans didn't get the way because the Europeans danced to our tune. We run NATO. This is a matter of power. We have all these fictions that we tell people about joint decision making. The United States runs NATO. And the Europeans do what we tell them. You can talk to the Russians about this. You want to know why Putin and Lavrov send a letter to Washington on December 17th and say, that's the response we care about? They don't care about the response from Jens Stoltenberg. How many divisions does Jens Stoltenberg have, right? It's the United States of America that really matters. Um, Sarah, you have your microphone out now. Then please give it to Jeff first, given that you now the one closest to you. Sorry. Back, back, back. <laughs> I'm trying to be efficient. Is it on? Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you, John. I, I encouraged all my researchers to come today because I said you'd give a very entertaining presentation. You didn't disappoint. But, I mean, so you're at EUI. We, we portray ourselves as a premier social science institution in Europe. And I guess I'd like to push you, and it's really following up on Stephanie and Eric, about sort of the social science behind your argumentation. Because, I mean, when I tell my researchers, like, developing an IR theory, right, okay, so definitely don't like just establish correlations. Give us some sense of the causal processes that connect A to B to C to D to get us to an outcome. Um, I tell them to operationalize their terms carefully. Uh, I tell them to think, well, what would threaten my argument, uh, the alternative explanations? And I just worry, sort of, in all counts, right, I mean, you sort of gave us a really interesting narrative here that just sort of fails on all those accounts. You, you keep accusing the mainstream narrative of basically cherry-picking stuff to tell us a story. It sort of sounds like you're doing the same thing um, to tell another story. Um, so that's worrying. I mean, what were your methods? I mean, how many sources did you look at? I assume you can only use English, right? So you're just looking at translated stuff. Um, I mean, that's an issue, right? Um, key terms for you, existential threat. And you made it clear in a talk, right? It's NATO expansion. Anybody who studies Russian politics, right, would tell you, in Putin's own words, the existential threat, as Aries comment, uh, going back about 10 decades, is democracy. He's creating the beginnings of a totalitarian system in Russia. And so one narrative that's out there, an argument about why he did this, he had to act now to invade before Ukraine became a democracy. Okay? And because that would undercut and destroy his kleptocratic regime he's created at home. Alternative explanations, final point. Domestic politics, right? It seems really important. You have to know this stuff. You, you express surprise, right, that Putin couldn't have wanted to take all of Ukraine, because look at the setup. They didn't have enough forces. Have you studied from the Russian specialist about the decision making before the invasion? Putin was listening to three people. Shoigu, who was telling him stories. He thought he could actually take Kiev and decapitate it. You're assuming there was some rationality that decision making process, but simply wasn't there. So I just worry that, you know, if we sort of really think about the social science behind your, your argument, it's it, it sort of, it, it's not there. Thanks. Veronica, please. And then, Veronica, if you don't mind, give it to your neighbor. I think your hand was up too, no? Yes? So, Veronica Angel, postdoc uh, fellow here at DUI. I wonder if there's any room for a nuance on your position on Western commitment to nuance. Ukraine. Nuance, yes. I'm just trying. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice to you. <laughs> really trying. Um, in your position on Western commitment to Ukraine's EU and, and NATO membership, because the opposition to NATO enlargement coming from multiple Western NATO states that you alluded to, as well as lukewarm Eastern European support uh, for, from member states, which you did not mention, but which also characterizes the foreign policy of these countries since they did join EU uh, and NATO, rather confirms the idea that the need for a buffer zone between the West and Russia also 
permeated NATO's strategic culture, um, not just the Russian one. So is it your suggestion that we should believe that the idea of buffer zone creation was never part of post-Cold War US foreign policy? And does that mean that we should read your interpretation of the war as a call for the ideological and material investment in a long overdue creation of this velvet divorce um, um, up, and of territories defined by fragile equilibria? And back to um, uh, Jeffrey's point as well, you use the word evidence a lot, which elicits you know, attention to knowledge-making tools. How do you conduct your research? It's quite possible that your position on interpreting Putin's intentions and that of people who study the area is so different because we simply talk to different people. Um, who are your interlocutors um, on the ground, your resources, the archival material you concern, um, and, and so on? Thank you. Let me just start with uh, Jeffrey's point. Look, social science has real limits, and uh, you do your best uh, with the evidence, and uh, you always live with the possibility that you're wrong. It may be the case that all the available public evidence points in one direction, but when they open the archives in 20 years, you'll discover that you were wrong. Uh, and this last gentleman, or the last questioner here from this gentleman, uh, that uh, this is just, you know, uh, a cover, all, all this talk about NATO expansion is a cover for the real motive because it's unpalatable, may be proved true. I'm not up here saying I have the truth. I'm giving you my interpretation. And with regard to the evidence, uh, before I go before an audience, and I go before lots of people when I talk, I want to make sure that I've got my arguments down and that the evidence does support me, because I don't want to make a fool of myself. I don't want to end up with egg all over my face. I've read everything I could get my hands on. I've talked to lots of people, and I've given this talk in different forums before lots of audiences, and people have run counter-arguments up against me and pointed to other evidence, and so forth and so on. So I'm reasonably comfortable that the available evidence supports my basic line of argument. But that's not to say I'm locked in. And Eric and I were talking before in his office, and I was telling him if he came across any evidence in a book that he was mentioning to me that contradicted what I had to say. Please send it to me as soon as possible and I'll change my arguments accordingly. Uh, with regard to what an existential threat is, I think the Russians are quite clear in this particular case that an existential threat is their, uh, a threat to their survival in the IR sense of the term. Uh, in the same way we view nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba as an existential threat. Uh, I think there's not much question that the Russians uh, see NATO enlargement to include Ukraine as a, uh, as a threat to their survival, as a security threat of the highest order. Uh, with regard to your interesting question about how do I determine uh, that they didn't have enough forces uh, to conquer all of Ukraine. I, I actually wrote my dissertation on conventional deterrence, uh, which really revolved around the question of a Soviet offensive into Western Europe during the Cold War. I, I know a huge amount about armored war and conventional war. I went to West Point as an undergraduate. I was in the Army. I was in the Air Force. Uh, I've studied uh, uh, German operations in World War II extensively. I've studied Israeli armored operations in the Middle East extensively. And I didn't have to rely on uh, anybody's opinions on whether or not the Russians had the capability to conquer Ukraine with 190,000 forces. Uh, I could count up how many armored division equivalents they had, how many they needed, what was necessary to conquer Ukraine, what was necessary to occupy Ukraine. And then I know enough about social engineering as well to think about what kind of force levels they'd need to do that. It is not even close. And all the other people like Barry Posen at MIT who I know who are experts uh, about 
the nitty gritty of conventional war agree with me on this issue. So that assessment is based on my own views. Uh, with regard to this young woman over there who commented on my lack of nuance, uh, I think there is no doubt about it that virtually everybody who knows me would agree that nuance is not my uh, modus operandi. Uh, but you raised the interesting issue about a buffer zone. And the Russians wanted a buffer zone. They wanted Ukraine as a buffer zone. And that's what they care about regarding Belarus, uh, Belarusia as well. It's actually NATO that didn't want a buffer zone. I went to Poland about three or four different times, and I told the Poles that the last thing you want to do is expand NATO into Ukraine because it's going to be like poking a hornet's nest and it's going to cause unending trouble for Poland. I said, you have the ideal situation now in that you have a buffer zone, Ukraine, between Poland and Russia. And what you should do is everything you possibly can to maintain that buffer zone. And if you poke the bear and the bear takes Ukraine, the bear's going to be right next door to you. And that is not going to be good. But we were not interested. The Poles were not interested. The Baltic states were not interested. And the Americans are certainly not interested. We wanted to march NATO right up to their doorstep. So my argument would be they should have been interested in the buffer zone, sort of getting in line with your points, but we weren't. Uh, history and allies. Uh, this is the question, this is the third question. Uh, why, why didn't the Europeans get their way? The Europeans didn't get the way because the Europeans danced to our tune. We run NATO. This is a matter of power. We have all these fictions that we tell people about joint decision making. The United States runs NATO. And the Europeans do what we tell them. You can talk to the Russians about this. You want to know why Putin and Lavrov send a letter to Washington on December 17th and say, that's the response we care about? They don't care about the response from Jens Stoltenberg. How many divisions does Jens Stoltenberg have, right? It's the United States of America that really matters. Pardon? No, it's not, but he was talking, he was talking about Merkel and Sarkozy. And Bush got what he wanted. My question is, why didn't Merkel stand up to him? Merkel understood. Sarkozy understood. It was the Americans who were pursuing a remarkably foolish policy. If you just think about what Merkel said, Germany, Germany is going to suffer enormously from this catastrophe in Ukraine. It is going to have really negative effects. And I say to myself, apropos your comments, why didn't she throw down the gauntlet and say, under no circumstances are we allowing Ukraine to come into NATO? That's exactly what she should have done. But the Germans hardly ever do that. They always dance to our tunes. One, history. And I don't think I have to explain that to you. And number two, they have a deal here. And the deal is the United States stays in Europe, acts as a pacifier, provides security for them, and they basically go along with what we want them to do. That's the deal, right? They don't want us to leave, so they don't want to anger us. They don't want to tell us to jump in the lake. And in the end, they cave in most of the time. They didn't cave in on Iraq, but most of the time they cave in. And on this one, they caved in big time. And I believe the consequences are catastrophic. Uh, your point about cheap talk. Look, your point is basically that this is an imperial enterprise, and they're covering it up with uh, rhetoric about NATO expansion. And I can't prove that you're wrong other than saying, I see no evidence that you're right. 
if when they open the archives, you're right and I'm wrong, God bless you. You're right. I was wrong. I'll admit it. But based on everything that's out there in the public record and sort of what fits in my story from a logical point of view, I think you're wrong that, you know, they're not, that they're not buffaloing us. They're not, you know, uh, they're not lying to us. But I can't be 100% certain on that. 